All right, so hello and welcome. So we're going to take a look today at Bander Brothers Episode 1. We're going to be watching it all the way through all episodes. So hopefully you guys will enjoy my breakdown, feature, reaction, whatever it is. Um, just so you are aware, if you click the link below or in the pinned comment in the description, you can see access to the uh, full um, reaction over on Player for free for Episode 1. It's also on my Patreon, and then Episodes 2 through 10 will be on player as a subscriber or on patreon you, know, you can choose whichever one um would suit you best otherwise the last thing to note is um i have seen this series before obviously um i have seen it once all the way through when i was a kid and then i think the most recent time was around five years ago uh, we will also be doing specifically scene breakdowns where i can elaborate more on what is going on in the scene in more details um, with pausing. Um, otherwise, this one's just going to be straight through um, and me telling you some details about it. Okay, other than that, uh, let's get to it. The guy says, well, you jump out of airplanes. You know, you got all your army equipment and you jump out of airplanes by, uh, to fight the enemy. I guess they said, go to hell. Nobody put up their hands. And then I don't know what it was, brought it up, but the, the guy giving the, the speech was saying, but you get paid $50 a month more. So that made it 100 bucks. And the uh, the thing about the hundred dollars, so they give you fifty more dollars. So a regular private would get fifty. If you add another fifty on top of that, makes it a hundred. Now, uh, this was as Winters will later recall in his book. It was basically blood money because this was a highly dangerous job. On top of the fact that it was a combat arms job and you were infantry, which already made it dangerous, you're then going to be behind enemy lines, probably with an exuberant ca uh, casualty ratio. Because again, the U.S. had basically zero experience with paratroopers um and the last paratrooper assault that the germans did on crete in 41 ended in absolute tragedy um and they were never deployed out of airplanes again because of how many casualties they suffered so that's what the u.s protection was probably based on again british paratroopers were also still um being developed and used um at this time actually you know, it was from there oh oh him. 712 days of that son of a bitch, and here we are. <laughs> the 712 days, by the way, would put that at June 25th, 1942, which is, you know, accurate since it was training the units sort of start up in 42. And another thing here is, uh, in my opinion, this is the number one most important episode, specifically because it shows the training and the bond that these original members of Easy Company will have. You people are at the position of attention. Now, this is what is called inspection, technically. Um, it is also referred to, depending on what is going to happen, as fuck fuck games. Okay? Now, the reason it's called that is because there are two different things. If you're just having an inspection, you get infractions, you know, it's not a big deal. This, on the other hand, is here you're doing inspections to find faults with you and your uniform. If they find faults with your uniform, they're going to use a punishment. Now, the reason it's called a fuck fuck game is because it doesn't specifically have to be a uh, infraction. They can just make whatever stuff up, and then they will go do their punishment, or in this case, what they were planning to do at the beginning anyway. It's not like all of a sudden, um, Sobel here is going to be like, oh yes, we're going to go run for six miles because I want to today because of your infractions. No, 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 no. Name. That, that was planned. Lucky slang for bullshit, isn't it? Yes, sir. Rust on the butt plate, hinge spring, private bullshit, revoked. You see what I mean? Name. Please God, Joseph D. Shut. Rusty bayonet, leave God. You want to kill Germans? Yes, sir. Not with this. I wouldn't take this rusty piece of shit to war, and I will not take you to war in your condition. Now, thanks to these men and their infractions, every man in the company who had a weekend pass has lost it. Change into your PT gear. We're running Curahee. And there we go, right? Whatever he had dreamed up of what they were going to do that day was Curahee. He just found some random things wrong with people, and that's going to happen, okay? Um... I ain't going up that hill. Hey, Connie, what are you thinking of? Blouse in your pants. 
Shut up, Vaughn, all right? He gigged everybody. Yeah, well, you should know better. Don't give him no excuses. Excuses? Why don't you come here, look at these trousers, get down, and you tell me if there's a crease on All right, on. let's go on the road. Uh, I actually agree with Perkani here. Um, not with Lawton, because um, he ever going to find stuff wrong with him either way. It didn't matter, okay? Um, and that's and there are some people that will actually get mad during training, be like, why can't you just be perfect? And I'm like, uh, the whole point is that uh, you are going to get punished. That's the point. You're not going to actually get perfect and have nothing wrong with you. That's not happening, okay? Another thing I'd like to point out with the two-day pass thing that Civil uh, was talking about there was that these guys have already gone through basic training. They've already gone through infantry school. Now they're at the paratrooper um, school, which usually lasts uh, three weeks or whatever it did during World War II, okay? Now, when this happened, these this is a training school. So that means your weekends are technically free. So you're not, like, confined to barracks and stuff like you would be for basic training and advanced individual training. Um, that's what separates airborne school um, from, you know, other basic training and advanced individual training. Now, what company is this? Easy company! Now, what do we do? Kill Do not help that man! Do not help that man! Do not stop! Now, that's just Sobel being a dick, because you don't leave anyone behind. Never. Ever. Even if they're the slowest person, even if they're carrying the most weight, doesn't matter. You all finish, you start together, you finish together. You can make it up there. Come on. Come on. Come on, Ali. Let's go. Come on, Gunny. Christensen, come on. Put you down there. Come on. There we go. There's Winters being a real leader right there. We are coming on 23 minutes. That may be good enough for the rest of the 506, but that is not good enough for Easy Company. Now, you see how Winters actually was the first one up there? Um, he was the PT officer for the whole company, and I maybe even battalion. Um, and he was really athletic, um, in his youth. So in, now, um, and <laughs> that will come up later in later episodes, um, especially when he does the Crossroads Rose episode and how fast he runs. That's just because of how actually fast he was. Why are you here, Private Gordon? I want to be in the Airborne, sir. I don't believe you. Why are you here, Private Gordon? I want to be in the Airborne, sir. You have 50 minutes to the top and back, and I will be watching you. What are you waiting for? Got shifty powers there. Now, he was assigned to run by himself. Now, if there's anything that this training is meant to teach you, it is that you do nothing alone. It is always with your brothers, okay? This is... This is it sets itself apart. So a lot of, of these units, even today... Airborne, Rangers, um, and then British Airborne, so uh, Paras. You always finish everything together. You start together, you finish together. That's what this is teaching you. It's only in modern times with very top tier special forces. We're talking like Delta Force and uh, those guys that it's more individual based instead of team based. But these guys are team based. What is this? Oh, shit. Anybody. Uh, it's a can of peaches, sir. Lieutenant Nixon thinks this is a can of peaches. That is incorrect, Lieutenant. Your weekend pass is canceled. This is United States Army property, which was taken without authorization from my mess facility. And I will not tolerate thievery in my unit. Whose footlocker is this? Private Parks, sir. Get rid of him. Yeah, that's actually a very serious offense if you steal stuff like that. That's really bad. Um, there's nothing else to say about that besides that you're supposed to not do that and you lock up your footlockers and all that other stuff. There's rain forecast tomorrow, so the company will have a light afternoon of lecture and classroom instruction. I think a, a special meal before their afternoon off would be a welcome change of pace. Would you agree? Yes, sir. I like spaghetti. And that's that's Sobel planning out what's about to happen here, okay? He planned that stuff out. <laughs> um, one of the stories from my training class um, was the, I think the class previously before us had to, they gave the, the instructors gave them milk right before um, they were supposed to have lecture and study hall for a little bit. 
Um, yeah, and so they changed that on them, and then, you know, as you can guess, if you drink milk right before you go on, like, a, you know, six-mile run, it's not exactly fun, so they throw all that up. Um, they didn't do that to us. Instead, what they did to us was make us roll around, like, you know, rolling around in the grass for about a minute or two. Then they had to stand up and run, and um, I specifically saw this. What has changed? Get up! There we go. Cancel. Easy Company is running up Curry. Move. I specifically saw uh, three miles up, three miles down. My brothers stand up, run, and then run sideways into each other and pile drive each other because that was funny to the instructors. <laughs> You're a washout, Private Hoogler. You should pack up those ears and go home. It's like Gordon's done. Aren't you, Gordon? You finished? You do not deserve to get your wing. Private Randleman, you look tired. There's an ambulance waiting for you at the bottom of the hill. It can all be over right now. No more pain. No more curry. No more Captain Sobel. We pull upon the rises, we pull upon the breast. We never land upon our feet, we always hit our ass. Hi, hi, Christ, oh, my, you, the hell are we? Zip, zam, goddamn, we're one infantry. We pull upon the rise. And there's Winter right there, being a leader. He didn't have to go run with these people um, as best officer, but he's like, if they're going to be punished, I want to go with them. So, there you go. He sets himself apart from all the other officers he's have Troopers. now the reason to do this equipment check is um you're supposed to not touch anything once you get on the plane and you're always checked by the the rigor at least today in modern sense the rigor or not the rigor uh jump master everyone's gonna do their job to check you okay you don't touch anything once you're on the plane then when you're on the plane they'll do a final check from your guys that say hey you're good because the last thing you don't want is for your parachute to not open <laughs> Especially when you're jumping at 1,000 feet AGL, which is what these guys said they were jumping at. You don't have time for your other ones now. Eat AGL and sticks of 12 jumpers per aircraft. All you have to do is remember what you were taught, and I guarantee you gravity will take care of the rest. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, And they get their famous jump boots okay now these uh these jump boots you know set those paratroopers apart right uh, along with their airborne wings so depending on like it's basically just to show that these guys are set apart and they've done a little bit more training than the rest of the regular guys so for example i'll put my whatever up there um the thing that set me and my brothers apart was our blue and yellow cords that we got to wear and everyone else did because of the training that we went through that was you know extra on top of whatever else everyone had said to regularly regularly do and then uh yeah also got my photo up there of me training the next class from the one time i did that so. oh my god here we go it's so bold and commanding We're in the wrong position. We're in the wrong position. We're taxable position for ambush, sir. I think we should sit tight. Let the enemy team come in our killing zone. They're right out there somewhere. Let's just get them. Sir, we have perfect cover here. Lieutenant, deploy your troops. <laughs> let's just go get them, boys. Mm. Yeah, that's gonna work out well, Captain. Move out. What? Tactical call. They're not even in formation. They're just kind of walking in a gaggle together. Captain, you've just been killed, along with 95% of your company. Your outfit? Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506. Leave three wounded men on the ground and report back to the assembly area.
You, you, you. Just pointed his sidearm at them. Oh. Uh, what are you wow. gonna do? Nothing. Just keep training the man. Who's Welsh? Am I interrupting? No. No. Lieutenant Lewis Nixon. Lieutenant Harry Wells, just in from the 82nd. Congratulations on the promotion. Oh, thanks. If you want to call it that. You learn him pretty quickly. Uh, no flaws, no vices, no sense of humor. Just like your chums of a battalion staff. <laughs> What's up? I'm hearing a lot of rumblings. Sobel? Just. Because you have to remember that Welsh is platoon leader, uh, Winters is executive officer for the company, and. As Winter said, uh, Nix is actually a battalion, so he's completely different and separate from him. Which is why they're scared shitless right here. Second platoon ready? Ready, sir. Then get them in formation, we're moving out. Yes, sir. Which is why Winters and Welsh are kind of scared uh, shitless there, right? And actually to go do the orders. And then you have Nixon over here with his smug-ass smile. Because <laughs> he can't be told of what to do by Sobel. Oh, that's funny. He's in North Africa. He says it's hot. Really? It's hot in Africa? Shut up. <laughs> Point is, it don't matter where we go. Once we get into combat, the only person you can trust is yourself and the fella next to you. Hey. As long as he's a paratrooper. Oh, yeah? What if that paratrooper turns out to be Sobel? If I'm next to Sobel in combat, I'm moving on down the line. Look up with some other officer, like uh, Heiliger or Winners. I like Winners. He's a good man. But when the bullets start flying, I don't know if I want a Quaker doing my fighting for me. How do you know he's a Quaker? He ain't Catholic. Neither Sobel. That prick's the son of Abraham. He's what? <laughs> he's a Jew. Oh, fuck. I'm a Jew. Congratulations. Get your nose out of my face. You know, I actually fought one of my brothers for less because he tried to capture a damn guy on in my room and me and him threw hands for about a good 15 minutes. <laughs> Just over that, so I'm not really surprised that would happen. It's all good fun, by the way. Totally. Hey, Sobel, do you want, uh, do you want me to paint a big red target on your back, too, that says, I'm an officer, please shoot me with that coat on? There should be no fence here. Tipper! Oh give me the man. Pekani, Luz, get the men, get them, take cover behind those trees. There should be no, there should be no fence here. Um, <clears throat> we, we could go over it, sir. Really? That's not the point. Where the goddamn, where the goddamn hell are we? Connie, Sobel's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. lost again, right? Yeah, he's lost. This isn't even showing him being a bad combat leader yet. This is just showing him incompetent enough that he can't read a map or even try to figure out where he was going. There, crap in the woods, son. Oh, That's great. Get a good major can goose this smuck. Get us moving. Is there a problem, Captain Sobel? Who said that? <laughs> Who broke silence? I think it's Major Horton, sir. Major Horton? What, what is he? Did he join us? I think maybe he's moving between the platoon, sir. What is the goddamn holdup, <laughs> Mr. Sobel? <laughs> A fence! Say, um... God. A barbed wire fence! Oh, that dog just ain't gonna hurt. <laughs> now, you cut that fence and get this goddamn platoon on the move! <laughs> yes, sir! For the private on the left knows it's fun. Uh, it's not oh, my goddamn wire cutters. Uh, totally would not, totally would not do this, off. but, uh... Sir, without it'd be Captain funny Sobel if you did. Platoon? It totally would get you an Article 15, but they found out, Double but they don't have to find out. Laid out a base of who was the idiot who cut that man's fence? <laughs> I was ordered to, sir. By who? Major Horton, sir. Major Horton? Yes, sir. Major Horton told you to do that? Yes, sir. Major Horton ordered you to cut the fence? Yes, he did. Major Horton is on leave in London. <laughs> 
Get those cows out of here. I love British Bears. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Well, Captain Sobel's compliments, sir. Lieutenant. Them bouncing the ball off of a first sergeant's jeep. That's showing that they don't respect that man at all. I'll tell you that right now. Along with, you know, uh, the court martial of Winters just going on right there. Because Sobel's a dick. No, sir, I do not understand. Your orders to me were to inspect the latrines at 10 hundred hours. From 0930 to 0955, I was censoring the enlistment's mail by order of Colonel Strayer. At 10 hundred hours, I followed your orders to the minute. I changed that time to 0945. No one told me, sir. I telephoned. I'm quartered with a family that has no telephone. And sent a runner. No runner found me, Captain. Irregardless, when given a task to perform by a ranking officer, you should have delegated your task of latrine inspection to another officer. You failed to do so. Were to let such a failure of duty by my own XO go unpunished, what kind of message is that to the men? I performed my duty as I was ordered, sir. And I disagree. So, your options are quite simple, Lieutenant. Punishment for your offenses will be denial of a 48-hour pass for 60 days. Stand before me at attention. Now, this whole thing really did happen. Or you may initiate a letter of appeal and request a trial by court-martial. Spend your weekends on the base anyway, Dick. Be a man. Take the punishment. Now, Winters right here is going to take the court-martial, or at least go to trial. A court-martial is like a really big deal if you're an officer, okay? That's like in a career-ending like, decision if, it, if you're found guilty on the charges. Which is why so we will shit himself right here, because uh, Winters basically requires requests, yeah, request trial by court-martial. I request trial by court-martial. And when he does that, uh, basically, he's like, hey, Sobel, you need to come up with evidence. Because Sobel had been gagging on Winters for a while here. Um, and, yeah, it ends with him being them going to the court-martial and then it being dismissed by um, the colonel. Um, and then it, <laughs> the next day, Sobel charges Winters again, literally the next day, with another offense of court-martial. You could see why they, Sobel got moved, transferred. I will not follow that man into combat. Me neither. All right. Let's do it. Now, this event really did happen. Um, and yeah, the offense, this is mutiny, straight out. Um, and the offense for this is, you can't be shot for this. World War One, there was a lot of shootings. In World War Two, less so. Now, the U.S. I think only shot one person that I know of during World War Two. The rest, again, were sent to prisons, right? Um, but other lesser uh, stuff. I ought to have you all shot. There's nothing less than an act of mutiny while we prepare for the goddamn invasion of Europe. Sergeant Harris, sir, turn in your stripes, collect your gear. Now, as he said there, Sink uh, said, "I ought to have you all shot." Now, he's a World War I man, and that happened a significant portion of the time, the French, British, and American armies during World War I. Uh, so his threat right there is not a, it's not like a little kind of false statement that he would make. No, 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 no. That's a, that's a big thing. Um, and he really did mean it, but again, the U.S. had a policy of try not to shoot someone if at all possible. You could do anything else, which in this case is strip them of their ranks and you know all that other stuff. And I want you to keep that in mind for the following scene that'll come up with Sobel. They were stripped of rank and almost shot for what they have done here. Okay, just 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 think about that. Because we'll come back to it when uh, we get to Sobel. I believe just a few of the sergeants may have felt their loyalty lay more to the platoon than to the company. And these few sergeants convinced all of the other NCOs in your company to turn in their stripes. As staff sergeants, they have a great amount of... Now, again, you have Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Strayer in here. You have uh, Robert Sink, so Colonel Robert Sink, and you have um, Sobel here, okay? 
and what they're asking him is, how is it possible for every NCO in your company to say they'd rather turn in their stripes and not wish to be, a, you know, under your command? Indeed, indeed it has, sir. However, your command of Easy Company has been exemplary. Thank, thank you, sir. Now, this is how officers fact, talk to each other, sir. Except for the actions of a few of your non-coms, I believe you fielded one of the finest companies of soldiers I've ever seen. Yes, sir. Herbert, Division has established a parachute training school at Chilton Foley. The idea is for non-infantry types who were vital to the coming invasion, such as doctors and chaplains, to take jump training there. Frankly, I can't think of anyone more qualified to command such a school than you are. Now, again, they are transferring soldiers. I'm reassigning you to Chilton Foley. Yeah, so they're going to transfer Sobel here. Now, you're going to see his face being in distress here and all that other stuff. But let me explain to you. Let's explain this whole situation to you. The NCOs turned in their stripes, saying we should no longer be under the command of Sobel. They almost got shot and had the ranks taken away and a whole bunch of other stuff, okay? Um, now, Sobel, Sink, Colonel Sink will take this information. He will talk to Sobel and say, hey, bud, um, I'm transferring you to a different, you know, unit. Um, you're not going to lose your rank. You're not going to lose your, uh, privileges or anything like that. It's just a side grade. Now, this is what happens to officers, okay? If they're bad, they're either promoted up or they're transferred out. Just go laterally, okay? Now, if for your career as an officer, that actually might be a bad thing. Again, we're talking like 20-something your career here. Um, if you don't do that, then it doesn't matter. But it would be not bad, you know, to not command a combat unit if you're doing a career for 20-something years, right? Um, but again, all of that is basically the NCOs got shafted, almost killed, and all that other fun stuff, and Sobel got transferred. That That's it. It's the world of officers for you. Um, but that's just how it works. And that will also come up again later with Dyke. Um, specifically to him um, where they will transfer him out um, after he does his whole debacle in Foy. So that's how Winters be, uh, comes back. These men have been through the toughest training the Army has to offer under the worst possible circumstances. And they volunteered for it. Christ, Dick, I was just shooting crap through them. It's not like you I... You know why they volunteered? Oh, shit, that's bad. So when things got really bad, the man in the foxhole next to them would be the best. Not some draft D who's going to get him killed. Are you ticked exactly because they don't like me? Because I'm spending time to get to know my soldiers? I mean, come on. You've been with these guys for, what, two years? I've been here for six days. They're gambling bodies. So do oh, what? Soldiers do that. Really I don't bad. deserve a reprimand for it. What if you'd won? What? What? If you'd won. Never put yourself in a position where you can take from these men. Okay, let me explain why Winters is, is mad here, and rightfully so. Now, I didn't understand this when I first watched the series, you know, as a kid. I was like, why is he mad at him? You know, gambling or something. Um, it's very, it's, it breaks down like this. Um, he is gambling with people in his own platoon, so the enlisted men. You are not supposed to do that at all, Okay. Gambling with other officers of equivalent rank or just, you know, around the company level, that's fine, okay? You can do that if you want to be hush-hush about it and all that stuff. That's fine. But you're not supposed to fraternize with your with your enlisted soldiers gambling, okay? There are other ways that, that you can do that. For example, what actually happened with Winters, um, I think he wrestled with one of the platoon commanders, and that dude got hurt, and then Buck had to come in. There are plenty of other ways you can socialize with guys in your own platoon, but gambling is not one of them. When there is such a rank difference and you're an officer compared to a guy that's just enlisted okay you don't you just don't do that that's almost the equivalent of like going drinking with your platoon members um and getting hammered and sloshed at a bar you just, you just don't do that 
Everyday supply, K rations, chocolate bars, charms, candy, powder, coffee, sugar matches, compass, bayonet, and trenching tool, ammunition, gas mask, reset bag with ammo, my webbing, my 45, canteen, two cartons of smokes, Hawkins mine, two grenades, smoke grenade, gamma grenade, TNT, this bullshit, and a pair of nasty skivvies. What's your point? You know, they stuck with as much as I do. I still got my shoot, my reserve shoot, my Mae West, my M1. Why are you keeping your brass knuckles? I can use some brass knuckles. Now, that might, that's actually pretty funny you know, with the amount of weight they had to carry. But it, if for the purposes of what they're doing here, it makes sense. They have to carry everything they're going to be fighting with until they get relieved. As I said, they're dropping in four to five hours before the main assault. And ideally, the main assault would get there in a day, maybe two. But they don't know how long it's going to take. That could be three days. That could be four days. That could be five days at the worst. No idea, right? So that's why they're carrying all of that crap, which is an insane amount of gear to, you know, equip. Um, and also, you'll see on Liebgott's right arm there, that little thing right there, that's actually a gas detector. Um, a lot, and it's also in Saving Private Ryan, too. You'll see it there. Um, but basically, it's supposed to turn a different color if there is gas in the area. So you put your gas mask on. Um, again, the Allies didn't know if Germany would use gas in this uh, when they tried to land. So that's why they had all their equipment like this. And it's basically the only time you'll ever see that. Why are they springing these things on us now? It's just an extra 80 pounds strapped to your leg. Oh, this famous Does leg Does anybody bag. have okay. any idea how to help this thing? Let me explain to you this leg bag, because I, I had to look it up for a bit. So, the idea was basically it came from the British. And what it allowed these paratroopers to do is it's not an extra 80 pounds on top of their 60 to 70 pounds they were already carrying, okay? I'll put a thing up there that shows you their equipment loadout that they had. Um, but that leg bag was actually supposed to be used for all of that stuff to be attached to their leg. And the reason it's like that is so that when you jump, even today, you do this with a rucksack now on modern day side. But back then, you would drop, you would jump out of the plane, you would have this leg bag, you would kick it off, 15 and it drops it down 15 feet below you um so that you ideally could kick the weight weight out right before you landed it would hit the ground and then you could land without having you know an extra 70 pounds on yourself and potentially breaking your leg okay in modern days now it's a rucksack that you throw you kick out right before you land drops 15 feet hits the ground you hit the ground okay that's the idea the problem was these leg bags most of their equipment was stored in there and then it didn't go very well and it went bye-bye and that's all of their gear go bye-bye right before they land. So it's kind of bad. Which is, I think, pretty much exactly what happens to Lieutenant Winters on the, in Normandy. So this is the actual day they go. And uh, from what I heard, um, he's also wearing patch 6-7 six, six, on his thing, which means probably stick 6-7. Six, because you can't fit an entire platoon on a single plane. So 6-7... Six, 6, 8, 6, 9, 6, 10, 6, uh, 7, 0. Now, what I was talking about here with the time is that it may seem like it's like broad dawn here. It was actually summer when this happened, and it means the sun doesn't go down until, you know, like 9 p.m. Like here in, down in uh, down in like Lubbock, Texas, the sun literally doesn't go down until 8.50 p.m., okay? So in England, it didn't go down um, until like late, late um almost pretty much at night, right? And then they still have to t travel all the way over to France and then jump out. And this is just them getting ready. They're not even leaving yet. <laughs> now, there's some famous, um, I think, photos of guys push pushing people, and I'll put a photo up there. Um, but yeah, they, they literally were that burdened down with equipment that they had to be pushed into the plane at this point and also helped up. Um, Easily, if they were at least 150 pounds, they were easily going, pushing 210, 220. Easily, easily pushing that with the amount of gear they had on. Not even on top. Just on, that's, that's just before the parachutes, too. So, they were just waddling in on there. Kind of air is making me loopy. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I've been on a lot of C-130s, surprisingly enough. Um, but, man, those air sick pills that they give you, man, I swear... I never took one, and I've seen people take them and then immediately, like, start throwing up. Um, I don't know. But, again, these guys have also never been in planes before. Well, these guys have been in planes before, but not, you know, it's not like a air today where, you know, you have, like, commercial air traffic where, you know, everyone flies, basically. It's like back then, it's like, oh, yeah, flying was a, 
flying was a novelty back then. Um, so this could get airsick. It's also a long plane ride, so who knows? Ooh, okay. So last thing here, because music, I can't, I can't show this, uh, this, the sound anyway. The Normandy invasion stripes with the uh, white and black on the planes. Okay, so this was specifically this right here. These were used um, on Normandy for all aircraft. Okay, they were told to put them on. I think June fifth or notify like June 4th, and then there's a 24-hour stand down, so they had, so it was two days. Um, and the reason they did it at the very end, like they didn't plan this out a week ahead, was because they didn't want the Germans to find out um, that they were using this and then put it on their planes so that they could, uh, so the German planes would be mistakenly identified as friendly when they weren't. So that's why they were painted on in like 24 to 48 hours on all planes. Every single, there's like over 100,000 planes that were in England. It doesn't mean they're all used, but that's a lot of planes that that was painted on. I um, mean, the whole thing is basically all ships don't shoot at you if they see the black and white stripes. All aircraft know that if they see an aircraft with that marking, you know, it's friendly. Because, again, there's there's hundreds of different types of aircraft that uh, that were being used, right? It's like, who? I, I don't know all these hundred types of aircraft, especially when I'm looking at it from a far distance, whether they're German or not, right? But I can see black and white. Yeah, that black and white stripes, that means it's friendly. So that's why those are painted on. Here we go. The invasion of Normandy. That would have been a real sight. If you could actually see the invasion fleet with all those planes of ever, that would have been a sight. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon a great crusade towards which we have shown these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander, uh, United States Forces, Europe. Because his boss was Marshall. General Marshall. <laughs> so. Alright, so that's going to wrap this up. So, just some last final thoughts if you want to stick around from now. Um, again, I think this is probably the most important episode um, that a lot of people probably, you know, just think is a little boring which in fairness it probably is, but it's very important because it shows the bond that these guys are going to have. Okay. Especially these guys. Now it is important to go fo going forward that everyone in this episode was going to be referred to as a Koa man. Okay. That will be referenced many, many, many times in future episodes where to Koa man. They're not, which is saying that all of the replacements and everyone coming from other units didn't go through the training and didn't go with this company through Sobel. Okay. That's what it's referring to is the men from Tacoa as everyone in this episode, besides like Buck, a uh, Compton's like everyone in the episode that you've seen so far is a Tacoa man. And then past that point, um, you're going to see a lot of replacements and they're not going to be Tacoa men. And there's going to be some friction there, even though they are airborne qualified, but that's going to come up later, especially in market garden. Um, that's one point to keep in mind. And again, I'll just keep saying it. Most important episode for the bonding these guys have, especially with Winters. Um, and everyone says that Sobel was a hard ass. And I agree. He was a dick. He was a hard ass. But the problem with that is um, there's nothing wrong with that. I had an instructor do that. And he was an Air Force Staff Sergeant, okay, um, before he was a cadet training us. Think about that. And then now he's an officer. So there's that too. But long story short, you can be a dick. Because he was a dick to all of us, right? But you can also be competent at your job. The problem was Sobel was a dick, um, but he was not competent at his job. And he was you know, hard on the men, but he wasn't competent at actually leading them um, in training or even in combat, right? That's the problem that Sobel had. He, the whole training, I didn't have an actual problem with. I mean, besides Sobel being a dick a few times, but more than necessary. But hey, it's training, right? Um, so that's... Another thing to point out. And hopefully I was able to break down enough the dichotomy, dichotomy of the officers and sergeants. Um, it and the NCOs, it will come up again a couple of times throughout the series. Um, but it's important to remember that there is that distinction, okay? There's going to be like Nixon and Winters, like in case some people aren't familiar. Those are officers. You see those little bars and then, cap and then Winters will get captain and other things. And I'll point that out later. But... Those are important distinctions because Nixon and Winters are basically best friends, right? And they're officers. And then there's other officers. Buck is an officer um, and all that other stuff, right? And then you have the enlisted guys that will be bonding with you know, other enlisted guys. Like, you're never going to see 
um, Winters like fully bond with other um, Easy Company men. It's not like he didn't have friendships with them, right? Or not none of that, right? But he's not going to go drinking. He's not going to you know joke around a lot with um, them, and that's gonna you will actually see that a lot in Bander Brothers. But I just thought I would point that out because that will come up significantly in the Battle of the Bulge, um, and a little bit before then. So. All right, hope you guys liked my feature breakdown and all that other stuff. Please leave in the comments um, all of your questions. I'll try to answer them, um, and then we'll have other guys will probably answer them because, again, I don't know everything. I, <laughs> I've only, you know, know so much, and a lot of people will know a lot more than me, right? And it's all collaborative, collaborative effort, right? And through many years of different collaborations, we can all learn together, all right? So... Hope you guys uh, like this and hope you will uh, stick around and watch the other scene breakdowns that I will do later. Okay. Otherwise, I will see you uh, next time for Bander Brothers Episode 2 um, a reaction for that. And again, the full reaction is down below for free on player if you want to go check that out. All right. See you guys for Episode 2.